Okay, everybody, welcome back. Let's have our third database lecture. Today we're going to talk about protein databases. Uh, before we begin the database discussion, though, we I want to talk to you about Margaret Dayhoff. And she's widely recognized as the, the person that deserves the most credit for developing the field of bioinformatics. And that stems from her early work on developing the first protein database and also writing the first computer program to analyze proteins. Um, then we're going to move uh, on to the databases starting at the National Center for Biotechnology Information on the NIH website and then moving to the Kyoto Encyclopedia for Genes and Genomes. So that's our lecture for today. So this is Margaret Dayhoff. Um, she uh, had a PhD in mathematics and, and then moved on to lots of different kinds of work. And then she got interested in uh, proteins and protein chemistry and applying her skills in mathematics to proteins as a way of analyzing protein structure. Um, and so she did that by developing the first computer program and then also the first protein database. Now, look at this picture. Who knows what this is? I don't know if you've ever seen this, these before or not, but this is a computer punch card. Um, and you use a tool or a machine to punch out numbers in a specific pattern. And so there, the numbers are arranged in columns. And so every column has a particular pattern of numbers. And then each column gives a certain amount of information. Believe it or not, I, well, this makes me feel old, but when I used to register for classes in college, I used a punch card almost exactly like this. And you would punch your name out on the very top and then punch out the course registration numbers in each column and then turn the card in. And uh, usually it took a while, three or four days later, you would find out what classes you were registered in. And so here is what I'm guessing. They took those cards back and analyzed them on a machine like this. And so it can do 80 cards per second. Um, it counts them up and then prints the information out in hard copy. Uh, there's a very limited amount of storage space as far as memory is concerned. So everything was printed out and stored that way. Pretty weird thinking about what we do nowadays. Now here. Um, is a picture of her first book, Margaret Dayhoff's first book, uh, The Atlas of Protein Sequence and Structure. She had 65 sequences in there that she initially analyzed by eye and then wrote the computer program to try to line up the amino acids together so she could look for regions and proteins that were similar. And now compare that to today where there's over 100 million protein records in our database. Um, we're going to look at one of those right now. So this is still, this is in the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is going to be placed online in the course website. Uh, we're going to go now to the National Center for Biotechnology Information and begin searching the NCBI protein database. Okay, here we are at the NCBI um, PubMed database. You should be familiar with this already from our work looking up papers and looking up DNA sequence information. Come here to the pull down menu and we're going to go to search the protein database. Now it works just like before. Today I'm going to search for a protein called PLC gamma 1. And it's just searching the protein database. So now it's returned our results. You can see right here that it found uh, 310 records about PLC G1 um, and it shows 20 of those records per page. That's why the 1 to 20 means. If I scroll down here and look at the results, they're organized like you've seen before uh, in individual records. So the first record there is PLC G1 in mouse. That's mus musculus. And then the next one is the uh, record number two is the PLC G1 gene in humans. And uh, this is the um, reference sequence when it's typed out big like that. And then so it's 1,290 amino acid protein. 
And then as we go down, you'll see a lot of these other proteins are also humans. There's another mouse, etc. And as we scroll down, this is going to make you dizzy, but here we go, down to the 20th. And that's just page 1 of 16 to show all these records. Now let's look and see what else they have in this database uh, for us to look at. Well, 310 records is not a crazy number, but it is a lot. So how might we narrow this down? Well, there's a couple different ways. On the left-hand side, they have filters. And they're showing us here species, enzyme type, the database that it came from. And if I scroll down here, sequence length, molecular weight, etc. You can, as you might imagine, narrow it down if you want to click on animals here. Then uh, we can use that to, to narrow it down. So all the different animals here, um, it's, well, we only lost a few. So uh, the PLC gamma dropped from 311 or whatever it was before to 305. Of course, most of these are uh, in animals. There may have been, there must have been a few records from bacteria or viruses. Well, let's say we only want to see those in humans. Now that's over here on the right hand side and so you can narrow it down to humans. There's 58 records in humans. So you click on the number 58 here. We'll give it a second to update. And there we go. There is the 58 records from humans. And so we've narrowed it down from over 300 to 58. So we've narrowed it down then to uh, the PLC Gamma 1 in humans. And if you look up under the search bar here, there's an advanced search too. So you can do like we've done before when we were looking for papers. You could put particular um, individual animals in there. You could put scientific uh, names. You could put uh, specific authors. You could put a year, etc. And so there's lots of ways to search the protein database. Let's look at one of the records and see what's in there. So here's the record for the human PLC G1, or one of the human records. There's multiple records they, that are uh, in the database for humans, and it all depends upon who submitted it. So as you might imagine, two different people around the world working independently on a similar problem may very well clone the same gene, and both of them upload their record to the database. And so both records will be included in the database. It's somewhat of a mess, but there's really no other way to do it. So what's in a record? As we scroll down you'll see that it defines the locus. So this is PLC G1 for human. It's 1290 amino acids. It's a linear structure. It gives the full name and often these genes will have multiple names. That's why you see alternate names given here. The full name is 1-phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate phosphodiesterase gamma 1. That's a mouthful. It's too much to say, so it shortened it to most cases PLC gamma 1. Then it shows uh, a session number, and you can use this accession number. Remember, as I said, there's multiple human PLC G1, so they each one will have their own unique accession number. And so that's how you know and can be sure that you're working with exactly the same protein each time. Now the database source, it tells you um, often when it was uploaded. So this one was created in November, on November 1st in 1990. And then the annotation was updated just a couple weeks ago. So they're constantly reviewing these records and adding to them. That's part, part of what the NIH does. Now there's a whole bunch of these databases. Some of them we'll talk about this semester and some we won't. We just don't have time. So I'm going to scroll down here just looking at the structure of this database record. There, um, This shows you the keywords that are used to uh, categorize this record. It tells you the source, the organism, um, and often people are interested in this. It, there's a whole big section here on papers about this protein. And this is the first paper, and most of the time the very first record is the first paper that uh, cloned the cDNA for this gene. Um, and that's usually pretty interesting to see. How did they clone it? What, what sort of samples did they use, etc. And then there's going to be a long list, and so I'm going to zoom down through these, of different journal articles 
like the comparative analysis of the human genome. So it must talk about PLC gamma 1 in there. Um, often you'll find uh, specific papers that talk about how PLC gamma 1 functions. So here it is, phosphorylation on serine. Here's phosphorylation on tyrosine, etc. So if you loved PLC gamma 1, you would want to read all those papers. And when you're looking up your own favorite molecules, sometimes you'll find some good stuff in there. Now as I continue to scroll down, let's get down to the next section. And it's right here. Just zoom past it. Not always, but often, there's a comment section. Now the comment section is written by the authors, and usually of the people that cloned the enzyme. And they will write uh, a little bit on the function of the molecule, its catalytic activity, whether or not it has cofactors, what kind of enzymes regulate it, um, if it has multiple subunits. So sort of just a short description about the pertinent uh, facts of your protein. So I almost always read the comment section because you can learn something every time pretty much. Um, this one is remarkably detailed compared to some others because it tells you about the subcellular location, the different domains, which is a concept we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and all those things. The next part of each record is one that's called the features and in this feature section they break down the molecule into its constituent parts. Proteins, particularly signaling molecules and, and uh, enzymes, are modular and so they, they, they'll have one big function. In this case the function is to hydrolyze membrane phospholipids to make IP3 and disylglycerol but they also are regulated by multiple other mechanisms and so each part of the protein does its own special function. In this case the, the gene was that, that's reported here was 1290 uh, units long and this tells you that the protein itself is the entire gene or the entire sequence that's reported. Now notice here in the record where it says protein that's, that's a link. If you click on that it will take you down to the protein sequence. Um, over here on the right, I'm going to collapse this, we'll come back to this later, but the detail section here is often useful. There's the protein sequence. It's highlighted there in the orangish brown color because we've selected the entire protein. Okay, But let me show you, the protein itself is split up into a bunch of different units. If you look down here on the left, and you click on this, we can go and look at regions of the protein. And so right now we're still looking at the entire protein, but this button down here, I can click and go to region number two. Now notice there's a small area highlighted now from about 35, whoops, I went to three accidentally, from about 35 to 120, or I mean 130, 142. Now what is that? Well that's where the detail thing is. You click on this and it tells you a little bit of information about the region you have highlighted. So it looks like from amino acid 27 to amino acid 142 this region is a domain that's called the PH1 domain. So we don't know what that is yet but we can learn a lot more about it when we go to the domain database and I'm going to show you that later in the lecture. Or we can keep going through, so there's region 3, looks like it overlapped 4. Keep going through. Now there's a smaller one, I wonder what that one might be. It's right in the middle of the protein, so I'll come over to details. Oh, another plexin homology like domain, pH1 or pH domain. Let's scroll through, here's an SH2 domain, etc. So you can see there's some interesting stuff. They've broken the protein down into the pieces that they think are important for its function. Besides regions, sometimes there are individual sites. So I've clicked on this one that says site. And notice that it highlighted a single tyrosine. That's the letter Y um, at 783. So if we put this up here you know, at, uh, tyros at amino acid 783 is a site that is modified by phosphotyrosine. And it tells you that this site's modified by ITK, SYK, and TXK. Those are all different kinases. So that's pretty neat. So that's some, some good information. 
So sometimes you can learn a lot about your protein without ever having done a single experiment just by uh, researching it here on the NCBI website. Now one other thing, notice the format of the protein here. Um, it goes from 1 to 1,292 or, or so amino acids. It's broke in this format which is called the GenBank format. It's, it's uh, organized into groups of 10 amino acids. Um, but you can't use this. If you wanted to copy this and put it into your biology workbench, you would have to change the format to the FASTA format. And you can do that right down here. However, we have the single Y highlighted. So notice what happens if you click on FASTA now. Got to wait for a second. So it's taken us to the FASTA format. But there's nothing there. Well, actually, there is something there. Just that single Y. So you have to go back, and if you want to look at the FASTA format for the whole protein, you need to go back to this and select Protein so that it selects the entire protein. Now if you click on FASTA, it'll take you to the FASTA format, and here is the entire protein. So you could copy and paste that if you wanted into your uh, biology workbench uh, files. Okay. Now to get back to, I can hit the backwards arrow to get back, or I can go to GenPept here, the link right there, to look at the full record. Uh, so now we're back to look at looking at the full record. I'm going to scroll back up to the top of our record here, and show you some other things that are uh, really useful on this website. A um, couple of things. Let me get back up. Here we are up to the top. Now, if you remember when we went to the biology workbench, we, we saved a couple of protein sequences and then you used a program to look for closely related proteins. And that program that you used was called BLAST. And here you can run BLAST on these molecules directly from within the, this database just by clicking Run BLAST. It doesn't copy the sequence over it just copies the accession number so you don't have to change that. We're going to search the non-redundant protein database that's shown here and if I click on that you can look if you wanted you could restrict this to only Swiss pro proteins. Those would actually be quite similar to the non-redundant uh, protein sequence database. Um, you could look for this one that are called transcriptome shotgun assembly proteins. Um, in this case they haven't actually found the proteins, but they've gotten the RNAs by a shotgun method, and then they're assuming that those make proteins. They don't always. So we're going to go back up to the non-redundant. That's the biggest umbrella and should give us the most interesting results. You can, this is optional, but you can restrict this if you wanted to just search in humans. You could type in Homo sapiens, and that will just search, type in humans. If you wanted to add another organism you just click on that plus button and here let's let's search for humans and zebrafish and then we can put another one in let's say but we don't want the frog no way who wants a frog um, let's say the western clawed frog we want to ex specifically exclude that particular taxa for whatever reason and so you type the name in here, you click on exclude, and now it will not report those records. And the type of search we're going to do is the protein protein blast. That's selected automatically. And then you click on blast, just like you've seen before. Now let me show you. The, now what will happen is that this will keep updating. So here it will update in two seconds. Okay, it's updating again. Whoop, I was going to the results came back. Sometimes you have to wait for several minutes or so, so just be patient. Um, here's what the results look like. There's a description pay part at the top. Then there comes a graphic summary. This first part shows conserved domains. And so we looked at some of those as we were going through the record, like the pH1 domain. That's the one here in the greenish color. Uh, we looked at the SH2 domain. That's the one here in the yellow, etc. We'll come back to those in a second when we go to the conserved domain database. Then there'll be this large table picture here that I hardly ever use. Uh, but notice what happens in the little box. As I scroll down, 
it'll put the name of the record up in the box. And so this tells us that this record, which is a PLC gamma 1 variant protein from humans, and it shows you that it matches virtually 100% across the entire record. So you can get a picture. I, I guess that's the interest here. Oh, sorry, let me see the purple down here. I, I'm about half of the way down on the right hand side. This is a predicted protein. Um, they're predicting that it might be a uh, phosphonostide uh, phosphodiesterase based upon sequence homology. But it's see the purple color here uh, means that the alignment is not so great here. There's a whole section in the middle that's missing, but then here on the left-hand side it matches almost 100%. So that's something that might be a little interesting. But I normally don't even look at this table. I scroll down to the next table that includes the description of the molecules. And they're arranged from the highest match at the top to uh, the lowest match at the end of the table. So the highest match here is the uh, phosphodiesterase gamma-1 isoform B from Homo sapiens. That's probably the record that we used, or closely related record to the one we used. Over here on the right is the accession number. If you click on that, it will take you to the database record for that protein. If you click on the protein name itself, it'll take you down to the alignment. I'm not going to do that for this one. Let's scroll down to find one that might be more interesting. And that would be one that doesn't match perfectly. So here, it, is a phospholipase C delta 3 from humans. Now let's click on that one and see what it looks like. There. So now it's loaded the alignment here. We've zoomed down to that and you can see that it doesn't actually match over the whole 1,292 bases or amino, amino acids. It matches over a distance of 405 amino acids and out of those 405, 145 are identical. Now if you look close, closer at that, within it you can see there are areas where there's stretches of identity. So this whole stretch right here that I highlighted in blue down towards the bottom in the middle. And there's another one right here. Now this is of interest and this is why people do these, these homology searches is that these identify regions of proteins that might be important because they have been conserved between these two widely different proteins. So the P, PLC delta three has a similar function but it shows up in different cells it's activated by different signaling pathways so it's controlled completely differently than PLC gamma 1 but it shares some conservation so that's of interest okay so that's the blast you're used to that let's go back up to the top here and I showed you that we would look at this picture and I'm going to talk a little bit about domains so proteins are modular as I mentioned before so think of each one of these domains as having its own particular function and when you add them all together that adds up to the complete function of the protein but domains individual domains are found in lots of different proteins like for example let's click here on the SH2 domain that's going to take us to the conserved domain database and in this case since we started with PLC gamma is showing us the whole PLC gamma protein again but the one that I'm interested in right now is the SH2 domain. Now if I hover over the SH2 domain, the, the top one here, uh, it, it will have a, a little box that pops up to tell me more about the SH2 domain. But if I really want to learn a lot about it, I click again on that box. Not the one that popped up, but the, the colored one from underneath the uh, picture of the protein. So we have to wait for a second as the database searches. And so now we've gone into the conserved domain database and pulled out the record for the N-terminal SH2 domain from PLC Gamma. And there's going to be lots of information about this particular part of the protein. We'll come back to this box here um, that's centered in the middle. Um, I'm going to show you how we can look at the structure of PLC Gamma. That's sort of fun. But to scroll down to here, what this box tells you here is it's found SH2 domains in a whole bunch of different proteins. So we searched looking at PLC gamma, but the SH2 domain exists in a phosphatase called uh, SHP, which is the blue box is showing us the PLC gamma. The other proteins are different kinds of proteins. There's phosphatases, there's kinases, there's other kinds of proteins. Here's one I don't, I've never heard of before, but it looks pretty cool. 
the N terminal SH2 domain from a shark like protein. Don't know what that is. You should maybe look that up one day. Um, you can get to those by clicking um, to the left on these little colors. And so it's now focused our search here on this shark like protein. Um, and so the shark proteins are um, ANK and kinase domain proteins. So if you wanted to learn more about them, you could read about them. But let's see, I'm getting off topic here. Let's go back to the PLC gamma and then back up to this area here. So this box here tells us that there is a structure that's known for the PLC gamma SH2 domain binding to the FGF receptor tyrosine kinase domain. And to view that, you click on this where it says view structure. In order to view the structure, you have to have a specific software on your computer. And that's down here. You can download it. It's called CN3D. And you can download it onto your computer. It's free and it comes from a secure site, so you don't have to worry. And it's not a very big program, but it's pretty fun. Now, if I click on View Structure, it will. You can open it. Now it's opened with CN3D. Let me rearrange things. Give me just a second. Okay, so here we are using the CN3D software and there's a couple panels here. So the first panel is the picture shown in the top left and it looks like a huge mess right now, doesn't it? Now you can grab it and rotate it around and what this is showing us actually in blue is the SH2 domain of PLC gamma. The one of the blue, the red, and the green. And in gray that I've swung around to the top here, that is the uh, kinase that binds to the PLC gamma. So it shows how the two molecules are interacting with each other. And there are other cofactors that are there. So this is a mess. You can, you can change it around and highlight things that you might find interesting. So for example, let's go up. Um, you can't see this part. It's outside of our view. But when you run the software, there'll be a menu area. And you can render this in a bunch of different ways. Right now, we're looking at it in the um, default mechanism, but I've changed to something that they call um, worms. <laughs> and so it takes you, I like this view because it shows you the alpha helices, which look like those crayons the, the, um, the, with the um, arrows that are, that are three-dimensional, and then the flat arrows, sorry, I couldn't get that out, uh, like shown here, are the um, beta pleated sheets. So it shows you the different secondary structure and how it's organized. And so again here on the right I'm focused on the PLC gamma. But if we swivel it around now that is the kinase. So let's come back here and just look at PLC gamma for a second. There are some residues that are highlighted in green and those are the particular part of the protein that interacts with the kinase. Now if you come over here to this top panel where it says CDD descriptive items, this can help you make more sense of your molecule. And I'm going to open this one up that says show annotation panels. Now that's a little bit off screen so I'm going to pull it down. And over here on the left, the annotations, let's see the phosphotyrosine binding pocket. You click on that and click highlight and it shows you now in yellow those residues show exactly where the phosphotyrosine will bind in your protein right there in the middle. So that's sort of neat. Okay, so that's how this thing functions. Well, let's look at the hydrophobic binding pocket. Click on highlight. Now that's changed completely. The hydrophobic, a lot of this pocket is hidden, but there the yellow, 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 yellow here. And that's the part, I don't know if you can see this, that I'm following with my arrow, that actually comes from the um, interacting kinase, it lies along this binding pocket so that the tyrosine from the kinase actually binds to the SH2 domain. So you can actually learn quite a bit about how your protein functions and how it interacts with other molecules by looking at the structure. Okay, now let's come back down to uh, the annotations here. Um, we're showing the RAT phospholipase C gamma uh, interacting with the um, kinase. But notice these that say PMID. I'm going to click on the top one. 
this is to the PubMed database. If I click on show, this takes us now directly from CN3D to the PubMed database to this specific paper. And so this paper is about the selectivity of receptor tyrosine kinase signaling and how it's controlled by a secondary SH2 domain binding site. So you can go back and forth between the database, and here's another one, let's see what that one is, and the structure itself to learn a lot about your individual molecules. Here's one that should interest people in biotechnology, a paper in biopolymers, you know, sarcomology two domains, structure, mechanisms, and drug discovery. And so that's really what this uh, drawing program or the graphing program is for, drug design, um, chemical engineering, and biopharmaceuticals make heavy use of this three-dimensional modeling to try to design inhibitors or activators of their particular proteins. And so that's why I want you to download the CN3D and gain some experience in working with these files. It's pretty easy to use and self-explanatory. Okay, so I'm going to quit from that. Take us back to our databases and let me show you a couple other things. And so here we are. Let's go back to the database record for the PLC gamma. Here it is. And we've done BLAST. We've looked at the domains. We've gone to the conserved domain database. I want to show you a couple other things that I hope you'll find interesting about um, these records. So notice here on the right, and I'm scrolling up and down, I know, but this area here, link out to external resources. You can view a lot of this yourself, but there's tons and tons of information that you can link to, and it's going to be organized with respect to the molecule that you're interested in. And so in this case, let's say I want to get a cDNA clone for PLC gamma. I would click on cDNA clone. It takes me to another website called LabOM, and if I scroll down here, you can see there's a bunch of different PLC Gamma 1 clones that I could choose from. Now, they're mighty expensive. Here's one for $560 and $780. The one on the top, the price is not given. It says Inquire. Uh, that's bad news when you see that. If you go anywhere, like to a fancy restaurant, and they don't tell you the price of the food, they just say Inquire, you know you're about to spend your whole paycheck. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's look. So, if you click on this one, let's say we're interested in this particular clone from Origin. If you click on it, it takes you to another page in the Lab Home website. But you can go to directly to the Origin website by clicking on the provided link. So here we are on the Origin web page, and we can learn more about the different clones. We can learn about other things you can buy. We can learn how it was validated, and you can actually purchase it. So. Click on it here, add it to cart, and there you go. Okay, back to our record. And so you can come back down here to this link out and follow it to a lot of different places. Now the one thing I do want to show you is this one that says Pathway Commons. If you click on that link, it will take you to here where they they're organizing the different types of pathways that are associated with your molecule. So let's look at PLC G1 human. Now the pathways here can be signaling pathways, biochemical pathways, chemical pathways, protein-protein um, interaction pathways, and today we just want to look at these 92 pathways in which the PLC gamma protein is involved at some level. Uh, so if you scroll down here you can see like number one, adaptive immune system. That's a pathway called the reactome pathway. To see that pathway, you would click on the source, which is here, reactome. It'll take you to another page, and sometimes you have to focus in even further, but um, this one looks good. It's going to take us right to the pathway. We can scroll and open this up a little bit. And so we get three choices here, the TCR signaling pathway, uh, CD28, B cell receptor pathway. Now if you notice in the bottom left here, we're only on a small part of the entire, so you have to scroll around like this to look at the different pathways that they're offering here. Let's, let's go and click on T cell signaling pathway. 
Okay, so the, the T cell signaling pathway is here. You click on the link. Um, so the, click on the link. Actually, when this little information thing pops up, it will give you uh, the choices that are available. And this one says, let's go to the pathway. So you click on go to the pathway, and it will take you to the, the T cell receptor signaling pathway. Again, uh, we're zoomed way in. We can come up here and zoom out by clicking the minus, sort of like Google Maps, and see more and more. But as you do that, then you lose uh, the resolution. And so we can zoom around here and look at the T cell receptor pathway. Um, it's going to be large and sort of complicated. If you want to zoom in, like yeah, click on this area here, the antigen bearing area. On the bottom right, there's a box that calls illustration. You can click on that and it will zoom in on the molecules. So there's the actual T cell receptor itself right here. Another protein called CD4 that it interacts with. So there's tons of information here, but it's sort of awkward to use. And that's why I want to introduce you to the other path, the other database, which is called KEG. So I'm going to directly go there. If you just go up into the Google search thing here and type in KEGG, that will take you to a link that is the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. So we're waiting for this link to pop up, and here it is. Now this is an interesting database because it was initially started by a single laboratory uh, and you can learn more about the lab over here by following these links. Uh, um, this is a lab in Kyoto, Japan that was interested in organizing information as it was being published. and They've done what I consider to be a fantastic job. There's a simple search interface just like at NCBI and so we'll type in PLC Gamma 1 at the top and then click on search. And it's going to come back because there's several PLC Gamma 1's. We have to choose the one that we want. And it's transferring data now from the server. And we're going to go under the KEG genes area here and click on the first one, PLC G1. But you could look at all of these if you wanted. Sometimes you don't know which is the right one, so you have to keep choosing. It's going a little slow now. This one's a nice one to use because it's in Japan, so they're about 12 hours time difference from us or so. So right now it's probably busy because everybody's up and working over there. Um, it's tonight. It's 10:45 right now, uh, p.m. in the U.S. But if we're working during the day, it, it goes a lot faster because the um, Japanese scientists are not using it in the middle of the night there. Anyway, here. So here we are at the Homo sapiens PLC Gamma 1 record. What I wanted to show you, the primary reason I use this website is to look at these pathways. And there's a bunch of different pathways. These are all different pathways that involve the PLC Gamma 1. Let's look at the top one, inositol phosphate metabolism. This is a this will make our chemists in the in the class happy. Uh, this shows you the role of PLC gamma one as an enzyme in its catabolic uh, reactions. So here are the results. Here's the enzyme here, and it, get, it doesn't give the enzyme name. This is because this is more chemical. This is the the enzyme number three dot one dot four dot eleven. That's PLC gamma. It shows you the substrates. Here is phosphatidyl and acetal. And if you hover um, over the different links here, it'll pop up with the structure. So there's the structure of PIP2. And it makes this enzyme, makes diacylglycerol. If you wait there for a second, there's the structure for diacylglycerol. And it also makes an acetal trisphosphate. And there, um, right scroll down a little. There's the structure of IP3. So this is pretty nice and it also shows you the different enzymes that are involved in the phosphate phosphate metabolism pathway. Now let's say you're more interested in the biology of this protein. Well it's involved in all these different biological pathways as well. For example the ERB signaling pathway. ERB is the EGF receptor that is uh, so important in uh, breast cancer. So let's look at that pathway. 
So here we are. There's the ERB receptor on the left, the uh, EGF, the different ligands, and here it is linked to PLC gamma. Again, IP3 and diacylglycerol. So similar information, but presented in a different way. Um, and, and then you can look around and look at all of the other interacting pathways that play a role in the cell at the same time. You can also see links to other pathways. So here's the calcium signaling pathway, pancreatic cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. So let's click on this, the pancreatic cancer pathway. These are all links. So here's the pancreatic cancer. These are all molecules that have been implicated in pancreatic cancer. And if we dig down through here, we will find probably PLC gamma somewhere. I don't see it. Maybe not. But all these other molecules are there. And if you wanted to follow them, hey, what's MEC? You would just click on MEC. Wait for a few seconds, and now we're looking at the record for MEC and all the pathways that it is involved with. So as you can see, you can spend hours and hours of joyful time following all these pathways, linking all these molecules together and finding out a bunch of different things. So I'm going to stop this record here since we've gone on for a bit. Um, you can explore these for as long as you want and hopefully you'll find something really cool. I'm going to link out of the uh, web browser now and come back to the lecture. And just because I want to show you at the very end of the lecture, and I'm going to scroll down quickly here, is your homework. So here's homework number four, and this, this PowerPoint will be online, and you can come in and answer all of these questions. The PowerPoint also shows you all the different steps you need to take to answer these questions. So you can go back and forth between the podcast that I just finished here and the PowerPoint that is similar. Okay, hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new, and I will talk to you later.